Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang, uh, I'm excited because we have somebody who has a wealth of experience. He is a global recognized author, speaker, David Meerman Scott, here to talk about B2B digital marketing. Now, David, if you could, you know, t- share with us a little bit about, and we're going to weave in also too, by the way, um, you know, some insights on your new book called Phenomenal C sure. and how that fits in. But if you could give us some insights and, and aspects of how specifically B2B digital marketing uh, is something that you can provide insight and value to. So I was a B2B digital marketer for my whole career, and I'm talking 30 years. Let me tell you why, because most people go, oh, wait a minute, the web hasn't been around for 30 years. Um, my first job was on a bond trading desk in New York City. I was terrible at it. I hated that. But what I loved was the information that the bond traders were using, things like Dow Jones and Reuters. So I worked in that industry for 15 years. I was a B2B marketer in the real-time financial information business. So I was able to totally understand how digital information is used in a B2B context, because bond traders and so on were using this, this information. I was a market, a marketing, uh, I ran marketing in Asia for a company called Knight Ritter for six years. I was based in Tokyo and I was based in Hong Kong. Um, and then I worked for a part of Thomson Reuters when I moved back here to the States. And I, so I had an unfair advantage because I was actually in this world of B2B online digital communications before anybody else on the planet essentially was. Um, And then I refined the ideas to um, work on the web when, um, so August 1995, my line in the sand for when the web started, because that's the day the the date that Netscape went public, and then through the rise of social media and so on. So I've been in it since before the beginning, believe it or not, Jim. So you and Al Gore were right there together. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and when I start thinking about that, I, I, I mean, you talk about the evolutionary aspects of it and the acceleration. Um, I mean, it's got to be immense, especially when you start reflecting, you know, upon those early days. I mean, for me, I even have a friend who was a trader who talked about the paper tickets that they used to have to go take. Yeah. Now it's free online trade stuff, right? Uh, well, what was interesting to me about back in the day was um, – I remember in the 1980s, the late 1980s, that the terminals like the Dow Jones Tellerate terminal, for example, allowed people to create content on the terminal in order to um, deliver to traders. And I actually worked for a company called Rights and Associates that did that. That in the late 1980s was blogging. So I've been in this world for so much longer than anybody else. No, I didn't invent it, but, um, but, but I have been in this world for so much longer than most people. And that, that was an unfair advantage and an unfair head start, which I'm really lucky to have had. Well, and now you kind of have an unfair advantage because you are getting the opportunity to interact and communicate with a lot of the, the, the thought leaders and top leaders. And, and have, you know, of course, you're one of those yourself you know, in this space. So when you start talking about your current B2B passion, what? Mm. So I, yeah, so I've been um, B2B my whole career. I mean, I've, I've, I've been exploring the ideas of marketing around all kinds of different things. And I don't see myself necessarily as a specialist, but I think what's interesting now is that we're all humans, every single one of us. Uh, we're all trying to communicate with other humans. So I've actually come around with a strong belief that it's a lot, uh, B2B marketing is more similar to consumer marketing and nonprofit marketing and marketing to educational institutions, government, than dissimilar. 
Um, you know, so many people say they put on their glasses and say, oh, I'm B2B. And then they dumb everything down and they, you know, they use the crazy language. Uh, we're the flexible, scalable solution for improving business process using cutting edge technology and missing critical applications. You know, that is not going to work. Or they use stock photos of random people all over their website. That's not going to work. We need to be, we need to realize that as B2B marketers, we are not marketing to businesses. It's not happening. We're marketing to people. And so we have to stop using crazy language with all these buzzwords in it. I actually did an analysis of what I call gobbledygook on websites and in marketing materials by B2B companies. I looked at every single press release sent in the English language for an entire year, all over the world, 770,000 press releases. The number one most overused word and or phrase by companies, you can guess it, Jim, can you give, give, give me a guess? We. Innovative. Innovative, okay, there you go. <laughs> so um, innovative was the most overused word and or phrase. And so, you, you, you know, you can't unsee the word innovative after I've explained this because Every B2B company, it seems, has, is touting in their press releases, on their websites, in their marketing materials, on the trade show booth, that they're innovative. But the problem is, if you're saying you're innovative, and go check your website, because you probably are, it means you're not. Because if you're saying you're innovative, you're doing what everybody else does. So by definition, you're not innovative. Now, you can have innovative products, that's fine, that's fine, but don't call them innovative. Don't say you're innovative because that's not innovative. I love that. Oh, so, okay, so with that, we start talking about what's overrated. So obviously, the, using the word innovation is overrated, but what do you think else that people are focusing in on? Because it, it kind of goes through cycles, you know, people call it hype cycle, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um so I, I, I mentioned it earlier, stock photos. I'm a, not a fan of stock photos of people. And this has not gone through a cycle. It is constant for the 30 years I've been in B2B marketing. People use stock photos of people in B2B way more than in other businesses. Um, you know, if you're using a photograph that you pulled out of a catalog to represent yourself, your employees, your customers, your partners, um, you're doing them a disservice. You're not humanizing your organization. So I, I really think that needs to be eliminated. Um, and I think, you know, especially, you know, as we're recording this, Jim, we're in the middle of COVID. And um, I think that the world, all over the world, we need a bit of a kinder and gentler approach um, to how we do business. And um, so many B2B companies have this incredibly aggressive approach to sales, a very aggressive approach to how they do their marketing. And let me share just one example in the world of ag what I would call ag aggressive and too aggressive. And that is the idea of, of always insisting that every time you put out a um, uh, a white paper or an ebook or some other long form document on your website that you absolutely require an email address to be able to download it. I think that's a terrible mistake. I think that's the opposite of being a kind and gentle company. I think what you're doing is you're setting up an adversarial relationship with somebody as soon as you say, you have to give me your email address before I'll give you my white paper. And, um, and that adversarial relationship sets a potential relationship with somebody that could lead to them being a customer off on the wrong foot. So um, I'm a massive, massive fan of the Grateful Dead. I've been to 75 Grateful Dead concerts. The first one when I was 17 years old, um, back in 1979, so you can figure out how old I am. And um, the Grateful Dead were the only band at that time that allowed fans to record their concerts. Every other band said no. If you got a ticket from the Rolling Stones, you got a ticket from um, Led Zeppelin, whoever it was, no recording allowed. And then when you go into the venue, if they saw a recording device, those other bands, they kicked you out. 
Grateful Dead said, sure, why not? You could bring professional level recording gear into um, the venue. And many people did. And, um, and so uh, initially it was cassette tapes, but then later on MP3 files that were traded um, in a social network before Mark Zuckerberg was even born that got people interested in the Grateful Dead, turned them into the most popular touring band of the entire 1990s. And the reason is because people loved the tapes that, that were circulating. They said, hey, this is great. They played in their dorm room, in their car, in their apartment, wherever. I want to go see a show. So the free content, no, um, no registration, no obligation, no expectation of anything in return, generated business for the Grateful Dead. And the same thing is true of B2B marketers. If you're putting your stuff out there completely and totally for free, you're giving a gift to the universe. The universe will give back to you. And what will happen is people say, this, this content, if it's, if it's good, they'll say this content's good. People will share it. They'll share it on the blog. They'll share it on social media. They'll send it to their LinkedIn friends. They'll post it onto a LinkedIn group. And your content will share. Um, and that's a better approach in my mind, giving gifts with no expectations of anything in return than setting up an adversarial relationship and demanding an email address for your content. Well, when you say that, though, I start thinking about the friction between sales and marketing. So yeah. I, what you're really talking about is a long term view and mindset, right? Yes. However, sales doesn't work that way. So that, that whole friction and managing that friction is something that really an important a strategy is, a, is important. So it could be, hey, these things are free, but then this information happens to be gated and you take people down a path. I would suspect that, you know, in your book and the research that you've done and talking with others, it's really that path and framework that's more important uh, than just talking about delivering information or gating it. Yeah. So I think that um, I'm a, uh, I would definitely support the idea of what I call a hybrid approach. The hybrid approach is that you make all the initial touch points completely free. So if you're offering your white paper on your homepage or in an inner page or product page, that white paper is completely free. No email address required, no registration required. But then inside of that white paper, there's an offer. And that offer requires registration. Hey, do, if you liked this white paper, why not, um, why not uh, subscribe to our email newsletter? If you like this white paper, why not um, check out our next webinar? Uh, and that approach works great because um, when somebody requests a white paper and it's the first time that they've touched your company and you require a download, most people won't do it. They, you are losing that opportunity to educate that cus potential customer. The ones that do, it's an adversarial relationship, as I mentioned before. But the ones that do, it is not a hot lead. It's cold lead because um, all they're doing is wanting to download that white paper. But then if they've read the white paper and then there's an offer in the white paper that says subscribe to our email newsletter, that becomes a much hotter lead because they've already consumed your information and they want more. So the hybrid approach is a much better way for marketing and sales to work together than the old school approach of um, you've got to give me something first so I can get my salespeople to attack you than, uh, uh, than the other approach which I advocate, which is educate and inform rather than, rather than interrupt people and try to sell them. Yeah, and what you talk about right there is one of the questions I like to ask, and probably one of those other common words that you would see in press releases, you know, disruption. Um, but being an, you know, an activator, you know, is I want to be a disruptor. We all have to be a disruptor. We can't do the same old thing that we've been doing. Uh, with talking about the COVID thing, a lot of people have been forced to do more digital than they ever yeah. Or, you know, and so a lot, of, a lot of them, in order just to try to get some action and do something, um, is they're taking everything that they used to do that was traditional in sense and just trying to move it to digital. That doesn't work either. Yeah. So when you start talking about being a disruptor, you know, how can I be a disruptor with what we've already talked about? Um, so absolutely, you've nailed it. It's, it's um, looking at the web and saying what's possible 
rather than just taking what happened in offline world and, and cramming it onto the web. That's exactly the point. So for, you know, for example, the whole white paper thing started because originally white papers had to be physically delivered and you would make an offer. I re, I'm old enough to remember this. You would make an offer for a white paper in print, like a postcard. Then they had to fill out a business reply card send it back to you in the mail, <laughs> and then you sent them a physical white paper in the mail. Um, and, the, and so marketers 25 years ago said, aha, we can offer this on the web. And they just use the exact same model that you have to fill out the form first, rather than reimagine what's possible. So um, I think just looking at anything, you know, now that we're in COVID, um, I'm noticing a lot of people are doing um, online events. You know, their, their big event was canceled. Um, their big trade show was canceled uh, where they were going to have a booth or the big event that their company was sponsoring where all their customers were going to get together is being canceled. So they're bringing it online. The biggest mistake is trying to recreate that physical event in an online world and just copying everything. They're completely different. And there's some things that can be done in the online world that are spectacular and different. And as you, the word you use, disruptive, and can bring people together using these tools of online communications in ways that just taking your CEO's keynote and having him or her, you know, in their living room staring into a Zoom camera, you know, with awful lights like the camera sticking up their nose and they've done it in, landscape, in portrait mode rather than landscape mode, you know, that doesn't work. But that's what so many companies are doing because they're trying to recreate it rather than reimagine it. Well, I think that's a beautiful point. So I, myself, I did a virtual event uh, a year and a half ago, uh, mm -hmm. three week event. I mean, we, we had, wow. we, we had everyday speaking, we had, you know, a trade show type of, you know, that was virtual. And, and then we also have turned that into an on demand learning opportunity. Well, it's kind of like what right. you're saying, that a lot of people will take the offline, move it on online, and they're like, okay, what's the next one, and not even yeah. think about that rich content that that can constantly be repurposed. Yeah, there's so, and there's so many ways that it can be done and, and people are reimagining it. I spoke um, last week at a really cool event. It's called, it was called uh, Skillsoft Perspectives. Uh, Skillsoft, of course, B2B, it's um, online learning. And so um, Skillsoft in normal years has four physical events, um, one in the Asia region, one in Europe, um, one in Australia and, and one in North America. And um, and it was scheduled for May. And so they, of course, like most companies, I think probably all companies, canceled the physical event. And rather than do what some organizations are doing or trying to do the physical event later in the year, what they chose to do is bring it all online. But normally they have four events in four different um, uh, regions and the executives travel from one to another, another over the course of a month or so. What they chose to do that was so cool, it was they created a 24-hour um, online event where the, the event followed the sun. It started in Sydney's morning, and then they had content through Australia, and then um, Asia, and then India, and then uh, Europe, and then North America, and then or, or the Americas, and then it finished um, sort of in the in the West Coast U.S. time zone. And and I, I was actually part of the entire event, so. Um, we started at night, me and Michelle, the, um, uh, the CMO of Skillsoft, we started, the, kicked off the event at night, our time, which was morning Australia time, did a, um, uh, I did a couple minutes, she did about an hour, and then we went to sleep um, uh, because it was done in a studio. We went to sleep, sleep in our homes and then came back. And then we did a full day, which was the tail end of Europe and then going into the North America time zone. And there's some really cool things that they did. We had, um, and that was done in a studio. We had a live band called Black Violin that was in the studio in New York City. And then I interviewed them live. Um, we used the polling questions. We used the chat feature. We had people have the ability to ask questions. Like for example, after my keynote, they could ask me questions. And this was a total reimagination of what a B2B um, customer and potential customer and partner conference um, could be. And they started with 
It's not, we can't do a physical event. So why even try to recreate it? Let's reimagine it and make it better. And that's definitely what's required. Now, part of that creative thinking is when a day is all said and done, a lot of us have constraints that we have to deal with. And so I have a budget. And yeah. if I was looking at my budget today and I was to say, I can just reallocate, where would I take money from if I was a B2B marketer and allocate it to if I were you? So broadly speaking, what I would look at if I was in that position um, and I was a B2B marketer. I had team um, at, the, at the, the largest team I ran was, it was small for many people listening and it was 12 people. I had people located um, in different parts of the world who worked for me. Um, what I would, so I've, so I've been there and done that. What I would do is the first thing I would look very carefully at anything where we're, pay, where we're paying for attention. So some of the ways that, that B2B marketers pay for attention is they advertise in the trade show magazine. They, um, they advertise using Google AdWords or other ad networks. They might Google, they might advertise in the social networks, whether that's LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. Um, and they may, they may do um, advertising by um, buying mailing lists or ad, and I, anything you're paying for attention. So I include the trade show booth. Um, you know, they're spending money on the trade show booth um, uh, I don't mean the booth itself, but the, the, the rental of the space at the trade show floor. Anything that you're paying for attention is up for grabs as far as I'm concerned in terms of a budget. And then I would specifically look at um, taking a little money away from there or a lot of money away from there and adding it to hiring journalists, literally hiring journalists, people who are professional storytellers. They're either great at... Um, text-based stories, in other words, writing, uh, or they're great at um, visual storytelling in the form of video or photographs, um, I would um, double down on getting people to create content, but not marketing people creating content. I'm a marketer. I'm allowed to say this. Don't hire marketers to create that content because you'll end up getting sort of marketing speak. I want storytellers. I want people who can put together really, really, really interesting stories. And while we're on the topic of budgets, I'm glad you asked this, Jim. I would also work with the CFO to do a little bit of analysis of, is there a way that you can take the way that the company allocates money and think about some parts of your marketing, not as an expense, which is what every B2B company does. Marketing is an expense. And figure out, are there opportunities to make some of that um, accounted for as an asset? And here's what I mean by that. In every company on the planet, if they buy a machine, it's an asset uh, because that has value over time. Every company on the planet, if they have um, a, um, a, a trademark or a patent, that's an asset. That's something you can sell. That's, um, that's, that's a valuable thing that you own. It has value over time. Marketing doesn't have anything like that. So I would look to see, can we value our website, our social media presence, um, our content? Um, can we value that as an asset? because it has continual value. And so um, if you think about marketing as an expense only, you will always underinvest in, under in content, which is what I just talked about hiring the journalists. But if you think of, of the content that's created as an asset that's valuable over time, then you might get that expense, that, um, that expenditure different because an article that a journalist writes on your, on your blog or your website today may generate a customer for you 20 years from now. Uh, I started my blog in 2004. That's 16 years ago. I've, I very regularly have people, um, and I know through my analytics, who are looking at the blog posts I wrote more than a decade ago finding me through the search engines through those ancient blog posts and then either buying a book from me or inquiring about having me speak or um, in some other way engaging with me. Content I wrote 10 
or more years ago. And so that's why I advocate, is there a way to look at your content creation and your website properties and your social media initiatives as an asset rather than an expense? Well, I think that's a beautiful point. Uh, now, we talked about that was kind of a constraints-based viewpoint, you know, like I'm going to reallocate and stuff. But let's remove the constraints and let's talk about, hey, I don't have a budget. I could spend whatever I want, right? Oh, my God. CFO says, let her roll, right? So where would you invest if I was a B2B digital marketer right now? Um, I'm going to tell you the same thing. I would invest in journalists. I would create a newsroom. I would have an editor. I would have then um, reporters or, or storytellers. I would have video storytellers. I would have text-based storytellers. And I would have an, an executive editor that oversees them. And I would run it exactly, exactly like a newsroom. I would also have at least a person, if not a team, doing newsjacking. Newsjacking is a concept I invented 10 years ago. It's the art and science of injecting your ideas into a breaking news story. And so newsjacking is a fabulous way to generate attention for B2B. I'll give you an example. Joe Payne was the um, uh, CEO of Eloqua. And Joe had learned these ideas of newsjacking from me. And what happened was um, he looked on his mobile phone and, um, oh my gosh, uh, my biggest competitor, a company called Market to Lead, has been acquired. What's going on here? And he went on to um, the search engines and did a search for Market to Lead and Oracle, the acquiring company. And not, uh, only the announcement, a cryptic three sentence announcement from Oracle, was the only news anywhere in the world that Oracle had just acquired Market to Lead. So what Joe did was he wrote an, uh, a blog post on the Eloqua blog about what this means for the marketing automation business. And that blog post then was the second piece of content about this particular acquisition. So now any journalist who needs to cover that, and they do because Oracle is a public company, uh, and then journalists who follow the marketing automation space and analysts like Forrester and whoever cover that space have to write about that. Now, it's not just the cryptic announcement from Oracle, but it's Joe's fabulous blog post. And uh, he generated dozens of news stories from this. That's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened was um, they generated a million dollars worth of new business as uh, annual basis, recurring revenue as, as a result of this, because people said, oh my gosh, look at this. Joe Payne did a great an analysis of what this this means on the Eloqua blog, you know, maybe I should move my business over there. And then the third thing that what happened was eight months later, Eloqua was purchased by Oracle as well. <laughs> and it was an $850 million purchase. And I did a calculation that back of the envelope calculation that the actual, the uh, uh, extra million dollars in revenue generated by this one news jacking, one blog post, um, was another $15 million on the purchase price given um, the, the multiple that the company sold for. So I call that the $16 million blog post or the $16 million newsjacking. Um, and so that's what I would do. I would create an editorial team and I would run it just like a newsroom. So when I start thinking about a lot, I mean, you know, been podcasting for over five years and you've been in it for a long time, I think a lot of the things that we have to do is self-reflection based. And we have to ask ourselves some grounding types of questions. And so when you start talking about uh, today, I'm a B2B digital marketer, what is one important question that I must ask myself? Um, I think it's really important. We sort of covered this earlier. I think what's really important to say to yourself um, are you a B2B marketer who, um, who's truly communicating with other human beings? Or are you doing the default that so many are doing and saying, oh, you know, I'm marketing to a business. You know, I'm marketing to IBM and Cisco and HP rather than saying I'm marketing to people who happen to work at those companies. Uh, and the second thing I would say is, if you, are a, a f uh, if you consider yourself, even in your, in your worst nightmare, but if you in some way consider yourself a failed consumer marketer, 
you know, get over that because it's not any better in consumer marketing. People think mad men and I'm going to dream up advertising campaigns and I'm going to go to the TV commercial shoot. Um, I think B2B marketing is way more interesting and way more exciting. And if you're, if you don't think that and you think that, you know, B2B was the only place you could get hired and you're really, you're really watching that mad men, you know, you can come up with ideas for TV commercials, then by all means go over to, to, to consumer because, uh, B2B is, I think, even more interesting and more exciting because there's, there's a lot more things we can do than just the standard, here's what you do if you're selling a soft drink approach. I think that's a great point. So you actually, uh, let's talk a little bit about your book that you have co-written with your uh, daughter, Reiko, um, which is Phenocracy. So if I'm a B2B digital marker, why do I want to purchase this book? Um, so what Reiko and I did was we looked at why is it that I am such a massive Grateful Dead fan? Now, what's going on there? Why have I been to 75 Grateful Dead concerts? I've been to 804 live concerts in my life. And so Reiko and I got decided to get together to explore this idea of fandom in all of its guises. And it turns out we, we, we spoke with with neuroscientists. We talked with hundreds of people about what they're a fan of. We talked with hundreds of companies about how they build fans. And it turns out that in our brains, every single one of us is hardwired to want to be part of a tribe of like-minded people. And in my case, I've got a bunch, and we all have multiple tribes. So one of my tribes happens to be the Grateful Dead. I can turn to anybody at a Grateful Dead concert, even if I don't know them and have a fabulous conversation. Um, mem people who go to a Grateful Dead concerts with me are among my best friends. On the left in this photograph in the green is Brian Halligan, he's the CEO of HubSpot. And he and I met because of the Grateful Dead. In the very first minute that I met him at his office, I opened up my computer screen, there was a Grateful Dead sticker, and, um, and he goes, wait a minute, Grateful Dead, what's going on? I go, my favorite band. I've seen them a whole bunch of times since I was 17. He said, they're my favorite band too. I've been to 100 concerts. And that was 13 years ago. He invited me to join the HubSpot Advisory Board right then. I was the very first HubSpot advisor back in 2007. They um, had no customers. They had beta software. Um, and uh, only eight employees. So I joined them then, and I'm still with them 13 years later. Um, and that's been a really cool ride because HubSpot's an $8 billion market cap company traded on the New York Stock Exchange now. Super cool. And it was all based on the fact that we were part of the same tribe. We we're both Grateful Dead fans. And my daughter, Reiko, my co-author, um, a millennial woman, but a fan of Harry Potter and a fan of, of Comic-Con. And so we teamed up to look at um, how and why people become fans of something and created a prescription for how organization can build fans. A lot of it are the, the tactics that HubSpot used um, and Brian and I talked about and, and, and I helped out with to get HubSpot from essentially no customers when I started with them to 70,000 70, or more customers now, $8 billion market cap. Last I heard it. Uh, their last earnings announcement, $650 million in revenue. And so there's a number of different prescriptions, um, neuroscience based, as well as just ways that we want to be part of the same tribe of like-minded people. And those organizations that build a tribe of people who are passionate, um, those are the people who will help you to grow your business because those are the people who will be loyal. Those are the ones who will share that they love you with other people. They're going to go to your physical events. When we get out of COVID and we have physical events again, they're going to go to your online events. They're going to follow you on social media. They're going to share. They're going to upvote all of that cool stuff. Well, and what we'll do is we'll put a link to your book on our show notes page. But uh, talking about a tribe, how does the B2B digital marketing gang actually connect with you? So a couple of different places um, uh, for the book Fanocracy, um, www.fanocracy.com is videos and other things you can check out there. Um, my website, davidmeermanscott.com. This is another um, lesson, by the way. Um, when I first went out on my own 18 years ago, I recognized that there were a whole bunch of David Scotts. And um, so I use my middle name professionally. I'm David Meerman Scott. I'm the only one on the planet. Um, so the Google machine will link to me. 
And then on social, on, on almost all the social networks, I am DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. David Miramis Scott, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. And we wish you the very best. Thanks very much, Jim. Great to be on. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.